I call the meeting to order. Uh, could we have roll call, please? Just needed to shift computers there. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Chair Gibbs. Chair Gibson. Here. Vice Chair McEwen. Here. Commissioner Crampton. Here. Commissioner McCarthy. Here. Commissioner Ono. Here. Commissioner Schmidt. Here. Thank you. And Commissioner Spangler. Absent. Thank you. And I'd like to call on Karen to introduce our new commissioner. Good evening, commissioners. It's with great pleasure that I'd like to introduce our new public work. Uh -huh. Public, I want to introduce to the public and to the Parks and Recreation Commission our newest member, Justin Ono. While Justin's our newest member to the Parks and Recreation Commission, he is not new to the Parks and Recreation Department. While growing up in Pacific Grove, he was a recreation leader for about six years and worked at our summer camps and our playground program. And he also worked at the Monterey Sports Center in our weight room. Justin has worked for the city of Eureka as a recreation leader while earning a bachelor's degree in forestry from Humboldt State University. He worked with trees for eight years in the Bay Area before moving back to Monterey and joining his father, who was also a former city forester. So another city connection there um, and was a consulting arborist for him. Justin holds a board certified master arborist certification from the International Society of Arboriculture and is a registered consulting arborist with a certification from the American Society of Consulting Arborists. Justin brings a well-rounded perspective to the PRC, and we're very fortunate to have Justin volunteer to serve on the Parks and Recreation Commission. So welcome, Justin. Great to have you. I'd like to call on Shannon to introduce our new staff member. So I'd like to introduce uh, Melissa Martinez. I don't think we had a chance to introduce you all before the meeting started. She is our newest team member in the Recreation Division as our administrative assistant. She started July 1 uh, and she's jumped right in and is learning very quickly. We're excited to have her as part of the team. She uh, fits in very well with the Rec Division staff. Um, she is the primary point of contact for usually just about everyone who makes a connection with recreation first, um, including city staff and families, and whether that's by email or by phone or in person. Um, she's, um, so we're very excited to have her and get her trained in all aspects of recreation. Um, she will support the Parks and Rec Commission as well. Um, she's uh, local to this area, but is actually um, a CSU Monterey Bay graduate. She lives in the city of Monterey. She's a program participant and facility user. She's on one of our softball teams <laughs> um, and she's a member of the sports center. So she's uh, not only familiar with Monterey, um, but familiar with some of our programs and services. So it's been uh, really high, uh, nice to have her here. She's kind of jumped in feet first and we're just wanting to you know train her and give her as much information as possible without overwhelming her either in the process but she's um we're moving forward with our implementation of our software and we know she'll do well with that she's learning our current software right now um so we're really excited to have her as part of the team um and welcome her to the city so terrific yeah I'd like to call on Karen to let us know what the Parks and Recreation Department's been doing this summer. I know you've been busy. We've been extremely busy. Thank you so much. We have a quite an extensive report for you because it's covering multiple months, more than just our normal quarter. It's going to be covering from March and through July. We're bringing up the presentation now. Is Nate able to move it to the next slide? Thank you. One of the most exciting things we'd like to share with you is that we have opened this golf at Ryan Ranch. It is a soft opening. We reached our agreement over the summer and they have completed the ADA parking spaces and access to the first tee. We've also installed an ADA portable restroom and hand washing station. And we're in the process of relocating and installing a new storage shed. 
and the club has already been actively mowing and um, doing maintenance out at the site. They're very excited and very uh, excited to open this course. They've already planned three events for the fall. So we're very excited about this partnership and they've been uh, doing a really great job already. The next exciting thing to share with you is pickleball and tennis at Via Paraiso. After multiple mediation <laughs> appointments and a three month pilot program out at Via Paraiso Park um, that took place from May, June, and July, we gathered and analyzed all of the information. We would watch and see how many parking spaces were being used, as well as how many people were on each court and what sport they were playing, what the weather was like, any extenuating circumstances. We took note of all of that for the three months. And it, we decided that it's best to go ahead and stay with all of the items that were agreed upon in mediation. So what that means is that there will be one dedicated tennis court, two dedicated pickleball courts, which were formerly one tennis court, no priority play times. That means you can play either sport anytime that you'd like, retain current court time limits and retain quiet equipment signage. Uh, we have had positive response from uh, members of the Pickleball Club, as well as the Neighborhood Association at this point. Um, anything else that I should add, Jenny? No, we'll, we'll hear a little bit more about this at NCIP when we get to that agenda item, but it would be to make the, the pilot program basically change as permanent. So we've already updated the signage and we'll be installing that. If Louis hasn't already, he's pretty fast. So he may already have the signs installed. And then if the project, the NCIP project has been approved, it just depends if it, there'll be enough money to get it funded. And if it's funded, then this is the configuration that you will see. The two pickleball courts are closest to the playground and the tennis court is closest to the parking lot. Next slide. We're turning it over to Louie now to discuss park operations. Okay, um, so big news, we promoted Steve Garcia, to park supervisor. Um, Steve's been with the city for 25 years. Uh, he's been doing it since July 1 now. He's doing a great job. Um, so we're really happy to have him on board. We've also hired two park maintenance workers. So we're getting back up to speed uh, on our staff. We're not quite whole yet, but we're getting there pretty quick. Um, we've just done a lot of stuff. Uh, we replaced some slides, prepped, uh, prepped our ball fields as usual. Uh, we've been really busy on weed control and fuel reduction for our green belts. Uh, once again, a lot of transient camp removal. Uh, our landscaping is going as usual. And we've had some volunteers for six uh, park and beach cleanups. Go to the next one. We had our cutting day. This is a whole, a whole what, about five months worth of stuff here. Um, the Eagle Scouts did a little bird habitat uh, project at uh, the Ryan Ranch at the disc golf course, putting in some uh, bird nesting boxes. Um, we installed some fencing and some landscaping around the Chamber of Commerce and the old um, visitor center and landscaping projects at the perimeter of Jack's Park uh, and Deer Flats Parks. We also uh, helped with a bioswale, uh, which we're doing a lot of bioswales now in these medians and, and traffic bump outs uh, for stormwater. And that was on the intersection of Casa Verde and Helvick. And so the forestry, we've been doing a lot of tree planting, uh, a lot of, we had some partnerships with the Rotary. Um, we gave away a lot of seedlings for cutting day. Uh, once again, the fuel reduction has been our main concern. And we're, I think we're probably more ahead of the game than we have been over the years. We started earlier this year because it start, stopped raining earlier this year. Um, but we've been doing a lot of replanting, a lot of street trees. If you notice, uh, if you see these bags on these street trees without irrigation, that's you know, those are all new plantings and we keep those on bags on for about eight months to a year. Um, we extend our contracts for the tree maintenance in the Presidio, um, doing our usual tree inspections and a lot of hand watering on these trees, keeping them going. 
and the cemetery operations as usual. Um, it's moving along. And I'll pass that on. So uh, with an update on Monterey Recreation Division um, programs and services, we have, um, including our special events, field sports, summer camps, and our three community centers that we are programming at the moment. Um, a lot has happened since we met back in March. So we'll go through those slides now. So we held our bunny hop photo op. It was our second annual event. It was a great turnout with happy participants and families. It's family friendly. It's um, in lieu of an egg hunt, a traditional egg hunt um, because of staff capacity and also COVID. But it's actually getting really good feedback from the community because they like the fact that it's more intimate. Um, they actually get a very decent photo now with iPhones and um, and the, our bunny is not a, a you know a serious bunny. Um, so, um, and uh, we are planning now to expand the event for spring 23, uh, potentially hold that on Colton Hall lawn and bring in some additional opportunities, maybe face painting, the wheelie mobile, things like that, but really um, gear this towards making it kind of a, a little family friendly event. Whereas the, you know, the traditional egg hunt, everyone still does an egg hunt at home usually. Um, but the traditional egg hunt we do is typically over in about a minute, but it takes a ton of time and effort and kids get trampled and it's just usually not a, the greatest of experiences. So we've revamped it um, because of COVID, but we found that this actually is just a better experience and staff really enjoys interacting with everyone. So. So field sports is still going exceptionally well. Um, our men's and co-rec softball had um, probably its biggest season ever with 51 teams this summer. Um, right now we're in the process of taking registration for our fall men's and co-rec softball and our 30 and over adult baseball league, which will begin at the end of August. And our field sports summer camps, um, and actually field sports youth programs. We wrapped up our spring break uh, track and field camp in um, the spring, and then we immediately transitioned to all of our summer camps, uh, including basketball, flag football, another track and field, beach volleyball, and challenger international soccer. Our enrollment was strong. Um, we actually had the cap registration due to staffing. Uh, a couple of our programs, beach volleyball and challenger international soccer are taught by contractual instructors. And we had to cap those because they were also challenged with finding enough staff. Uh, so we wanna maintain healthy ratios of kids to staff and we, so we capped those. Um, what's next is we are in the process of taking registration for peewee and junior uh, soccer. And that will begin in the first week of September. So field sports facilities and revenue, revenue continues to be a high demand for city facilities and outdoor sports programs. At this time, we're estimating at least 92% cost recovery or revenue for fiscal year 22, uh, 2022. Uh, we are going to evaluate the Amberjacks use of uh, the fields for summer 23, just to see I think this will be their final, potentially their final year of a five-year agreement. Uh, we are looking into potential field improvements for Solicito with some um, potential grant funding. Um, and it's just a matter of if we can qualify for that and also get that done in a timely manner that isn't going to affect rec programs and revenue and also potentially um, be available for Monterey High School um, when they're ready to start their baseball season. So it's just a, a fine juggling act. We'll see if we're able to pull that off. So Monterey Recreation Summer Camps. We had a really, really good summer. Was it summer 2019? No, it definitely was not. Um, but our, you know, our theme of camp at Camp Kinsabi was Peace Love Camp. And it really, um, you know, kind of chokes me up, but it really was a great summer all around. Like, 
We COVID-19 was definitely an impact to our camp programs. Uh, we knew that it was going to be. Um, so we, we planned for lower enrollment and hiring less staff. It ended up being even more of a challenge because COVID spiked um, right around June and July. Not really sure why. Uh, so we ended up receiving requests for cancellations and parents were making changes to their schedules because they felt uh, uncomfortable enrolling their children. Um, we also had um, staff, like probably more staff this summer with COVID-19 than at, since March of 2020. Like it just really exploded. Um, were people getting as sick? No, but they were out for, you know, as many as 10 days. And so out for 10 days, but also bringing in a program sub. To, so we're paying COVID leave and we're paying for the staff to replace them. And we're already short staff as it is. So it, it was a very big challenge this summer. Um, we know that we want to fundraise. We need to fundraise to provide campership opportunities. We are already expanding our marketing for summer 23. And we're starting early with recruitment and planning. We plan to, you know, really get the word out well in advance that here's our summer camps for 23. Here's our recruitment and our job opportunities. And one thing that we really want to do is we want to create an inclusive and welcoming environment for all. Um, and I think that that needs to be a focus of our future programming um, is we just we just need to be offering programs and services that serve everyone with no matter their abilities or their race or gender or anything. We are just going to be an open, inclusive environment for everyone. Um, and it just became obvious that that is definitely somewhere where we need to be going um, with all of our programs and, and our staff and everything. And we had a very diverse group of staff. Um, and so we just wanna make sure that we are also um, we're modeling that for our, our participants. So next, so we had Camp Kinsabi Youth Overnight Program. Um, this was 69 years for Camp Kinsabi. Um, enrollment was approximately 50% of 2019. We were shooting for 60, it was about 50. Um, we had 252 campers. We did not offer family camp this summer, which is, it is very popular, but we did not offer it because of COVID. We were concerned about bringing in a new crop of individuals on a weekend and potentially exposing staff and then having to shut down camp because the focus is the kids, always gonna be the kids first. Uh, we want um, to continue to provide campership opportunities and reach all of Monterey County, not just the peninsula. Um, we are going to start planning for 20 immediately for summer 23. We actually already have set our camp dates for next year. We did have a great staff and camp directors this summer to re rebuild and reimagine CQS. That's one of the reasons why I think Camp Kinsabi went so well this year is there's just so much history um, and tradition and so many People um, have retained that knowledge over the years. So it was, was it easy? No, but it was definitely worth it. The Whispering Pines Day Camp also returned. Um, I think this would have been Day Camp's 65th summer. Uh, enrollment did average about 50% of 2019 with 240 campers. Uh, it became obvious that this is rebuilding is going to be an ongoing effort for day camp. We need to focus on recruiting, recruiting and retaining camp directors um, in order to create uh, some tradition and some history for this as well and not have to be continually retraining a new set of directors. That's why Camp Kinsabi has been so successful is there has been very little change in directors over the years. Um, there's probably, I guess, three administrations, if you want to look at it that way for Camp Kinsabi. Um, so we uh, really need to focus on doing the same for day camp. Um, and we want to also create an opportunity for children to transition to Camp Kinsabi. Uh, so this is for five to nine year olds and it is a camp environment. It is a camp program. They don't sleep over. Um, but then Camp Kinsabi, when they're ready or their parents are ready is for seven to 15 years old. 
Um, and that would be an overnight program. So we're hoping to create like not just a, a day camp, but a feeder program to Camp Kinsaki. So our summer fun playground program um, was offered at three sites this summer via Paraiso Hilltop and Casanova. We had 118 participants, which was an increased enrollment over summer of 21, because we did offer a very similar program in summer 21. This program provides an affordable option for families needing summer childcare because the fee is one flat fee for the entire seven weeks. Um, so they get Monday through Friday care from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And it really is the best option, um, I think, on the peninsula still. So Schulte Park Center continues to offer services for adults and seniors and adding to its list of programming. Um, it still is serving drive through meals on wheels Tuesdays through Friday, which it remains a very popular program. We have our consistent group of seniors who come and pick up food every uh, day. We also offer the produce distribution um, every Monday through the, with the food bank. So this week they got tomatoes, celery, strawberries, um, a, you know, a bunch of fresh produce, and that's really very popular. And so we're just going to continue to expand our program offerings each month under the direction of Sarah Zeal, our recreation coordinator. And then Ellis Cerro um, is busy, very busy. Nate uh, Coda, our recreation supervisor, is really wearing two hats um, all the time. He's our supervisor and he's assisting me and he's trying to learn summer camps and everything, but he's also still running a community center, um, which is you know, a job in and of itself. Um, so gymnastics enrollment is strong. Uh, they also offered a, a goodly amount of summer camps themselves, including two weeks of gymnastics, two weeks of Lego and uh, woodworking camp, which was a blast. Um, they have piano, preschool, dance classes, fencing club and classes on the weekends. Um, and they've expanded their piano lessons. We are also going to begin offering a Chefs for Kids program and expanding hours and programs um, very soon. So we're just working on recruiting the staff in order to um, expand our program hours. Hilltop Park is, again, very busy. Rachel uh, Dice, our recreation coordinator, is up at Hilltop. So we have a very strong Pilates for Bone Health program uh, for adults and seniors. Um, our monthly blood, blood drives are up there, um, guitar and piano lessons, ballet and hip hop for kids, as well as nonprofit facility rentals. We brought back adult ceramics. Um, I want to say that was in, in the spring, but April, May, and it immediately filled um, both programs with a waiting list. Um, and we're on our second session, moving into our third um, and again, adult ceramics is we have a very excellent instructor um, who's got a master's in ceramics and it's been a very popular program. So we're happy to have that back. And then we're also working on expanding our programs and hours at Hilltop. So both Ellis Darrow and Hilltop continue to offer pre preschool programs. The summer preschool program is called Tiny Tot Summer Camp. Um, maximum enrollment would have been 80. We ended up with 73, um, because we lost a few kids to COVID, um, but not from us, not because they got it from us, but we just natural attrition, I guess it would be. Uh, we've also started our new preschool year. Um, and that began the first week of August, um, when MPUSD also went back. So we're enrolling preschool students ages three to five, both at Hilltop and El Estero. So what's next for Monterey Recreation? We are planning for a Halloween trunk and treat on Saturday, October 22nd. Um, we're gonna be reaching out to community groups to see if they'd like to participate. Um, we're doing this in conjunction, hopefully with the Monterey Firefighters Charitable Fund. Um, they'll do a movie night after we do our trunk and treat. And if anyone doesn't know what a trunk and treat is, you basically take 
a vehicle, a car, a van, and you open up the trunk and you decorate that for Halloween. And then the kids go from trunk to trunk trick or treating. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to have our city rec van there. We hope to get like Monterey firefighters with a, uh, maybe a zombie engine, MP, MPD, <laughs> maybe the Kiwanis of the Rotary want to join us. Um, and it's a safe way for kids to trick, trick or treat. Um, and we'll do that on Pacific Street. Um, we are also planning for our drive through meal programs. We're going to be doing meal kits again. They serve a different population of, of usually of families um, for their holiday meal kits. Um, and we'll do that Thanksgiving and for the Christmas holiday break. Um, so we'll get a full meal kit um, and drive through you know, El Stero, you know, the usual location that we've been doing it. Um, and then they're still going to potentially be offering uh, fully cooked meals, individual meals at the fairgrounds for those individuals who aren't able to cook um, or just live alone or something like that, that will serve a different population. Um, we are focusing on recruitment of both full part-time and full-time staff. We have one position that was approved with a budget. So we're hoping to get that information over to HR soon so we can start a recruitment. We are expanding our program offerings based on staff capacity and budget shooting for our software launch um, in the fall. And then we've already started planning for summer 23. Well, that's it for recreation. It's been a busy few months. Yep. Okay, now we're going to transition to the Monterey Sports Center. And uh, some of you may have heard that we are partnering with a consultant to do an operational assessment of the Monterey Sports Center. and. Why do we need a consultant, you may ask? Well, first of all, COVID-19 had impacted the fitness industry and has affected not only fitness operational practices, but also how consumers behave and how they choose to stay active. The sports center staff is also very limited and they're 100% focused on daily operations, marketing, program delivery, and customer service. And sports facilities companies, or SFC for short, um, is a subject matter expert in operational practices, space utilization, and market analysis. So we're excited to work side by side with FSC to refine our vision, define our success, and create a sustainable plan for the continued success of the city's crown jewel of the Monterey Sports Center. The total project timeline is expected to take about 14 weeks, and the first phase entails a project kickoff call, which we did last month. Step two is existing data review and market analysis. That is in progress right now. We've been submitting all kinds of data. They provided a list to us, and then we're giving them all the information they need, financials, budgets, enrollment counts, you name it. Um, we've just been providing everything that they need. Step three is a facility site visit, strategic planning session, and department interviews. And this is also in, in progress. We did have the site visit. They visited here from Florida and spent two days with us. And so we completed a facility tour and a multi-user focus groups, multiple sessions, like eight or more, maybe? I think 10 all together. Yeah, all together. Uh, staff interviews and stakeholder meetings, as well as nearby market research. And we're in the process of developing a survey for MSC users as well as the community. So they're helping us formulate the survey based on the feedback they got in the focus groups and the stakeholder meetings. So that's really great. Um, and now we're on also on step four that will lead us to a detailed report that will entail operational findings and recommendations. If we go to the next slide that will show you what that report will entail. I could start telling you, there we go. <laughs> Organizational development, business development, operational processes and systems, review of membership programming and services, financial performance and physical facility space utilization. Next slide. Then we go to phase two, which will entail a detailed financial forecast, includes more in-depth research analysis to produce a five-year cash flow forecast and detailed financial projections. 
and an optimization timeline that entails strategies and tactical action steps to help the facility reach optimal operational success. So, so far, while it's been a lot of work, the process and the partnership with SFC has been going really well. And we're confident that together we're gonna to forge the best path forward with the Monterey Sports Center. Uh, they, they, their goal is to actually give us an action plan where not just a big binder that's going to collect dust on the shelf, but actually something that we could use that has hard action items that we can take advantage of. So we're excited about that. Yep. Next, I'll hand it over to Andrea Willer. Okay, and I just wanna thank um, the folks in the room or uh, virtually that participated in some of those focus groups. Um, Karen and I sat through all of them and the feedback was very, very helpful. And um, we really appreciated everyone's honesty and transparency and that's how we're gonna get better. So thank you um, to everyone who participated. Um, okay, we have some exciting uh, news. We have completed a few projects at the Sports Center. The most exciting is the water slide is now open. Yay. Ellen, I haven't seen you go down yet, but um, I'm hoping soon. Yep. Uh, so we're very excited about that. Everyone knows what a big hit that is for uh, the community and, and that's been great. Um, we tented the natatorium windows. Uh, it's a project we've been wanting to do for a while. Uh, because there's a glare from uh, the sun deck at certain times of day, and it just um, is a lot safer if we can reduce that glare and the lifeguards can see more clearly. Um, and then we installed a water bottle filling station down by Studio One. Um, without our cafe, um, you know, we're trying to give people opportunities to fill up their water bottles so they don't have to keep lugging, you know, plastic bottles in and whatnot. So um, that was a big win also. And then we have some, um, a lot of projects coming up. Um, we have locker room floors being redone starting August 22nd. Yay. Um, super excited about that. It's going to be tough because the locker rooms will be closed for two full weeks while we get that work done, but it's, it's needed if anyone who's gotten in their nose. Um, so we're excited to get that going. Uh, the gym and studio two floors will be completely sanded down to raw wood. Uh, in the gym, we'll paint new lines, we'll do the resurfacing. That has not been done in many, many years in the gym, so we're excited about that. Uh, Studio One, we're going to motorize the windows. If anyone's familiar with Studio One, um, it's great because we have a lot of windows. I want to say maybe 14 or so um, around, so we get a lot of natural light and we can get natural ventilation, but they're manual. So um, it's very challenging and time consuming to get those open and closed. So we're gonna motorize those and make it easy on our instructors. Um, Studio two windows all need to be replaced and that's gonna be happening soon. And then um, this is exciting, the front entrance, we are gonna be replacing those doors with automatic sliding doors like you see at um, grocery stores and whatnot. So there'll be a sensor as you walk up, they'll automatically slide open for you. Um, and that's gonna be a huge upgrade, especially with ADA um, concerns. And then um, several of the natatorium doors, not all of them, but several of them will also be replaced. Um, and then I think we'll talk about it again later, but NCIP has um, agreed to fund our dehumidifier at 1.2 million. And I just wanna give a special thanks to NCIP for that. That is huge for us. Um, there's no point in really doing much more in the natatorium until we get that situated. So that's really, really exciting. Um, and then there are several other repairs and upgrades um, that are gonna go through the CIP process. So those aren't exactly dialed in um, as much as the ones previous on the list, uh, but really, really exciting that we're putting some much needed love and attention into the sports center. So we're excited about that. All right, another new thing, uh, we have a brand new newsletter and um, I wanna give a shout out to uh, our part-time marketing specialist. Her name is Shannon McCourt. And she has taken this on with gusto and it is absolutely beautiful. Um, if you have not received it, it's because you need to sign up for it. So you can go to our website and you can enter your email address and then that will subscribe you to our monthly newsletter or you can text 22828 um, and get it that way. Uh, basically the newsletter has a message from the manager, any upcoming promotions that we might be doing, program updates and staff highlights. So right now we're highlighting every month, one personal trainer, one group exercise instructor. Um, and we've had just 
really, really great feedback from that. So um, please subscribe if you aren't subscribed already, because it's a great way to stay in touch with what's going on. Okay, and then I'm just going to go through kind of the regular program updates that I typically do. Again, remember, this is for five months. <laughs> um, so between March 1st and July 31st, we sold over 13,000 drop-in passes. So those are non-members who just pay the daily visit fee. Um, 239 10-visit passes and 8,322 memberships. Now that's a little misleading, I will admit, because um, as you guys know, we don't currently do the auto bill month-to-month um, -month memberships because of some software issues. So people who want to do month-to-month -month are swiping their credit card every month. And so they're counted multiple times. Um, so I just wanted to be clear on that. It's not, um, some of those are repeat customers. Um, but still we brought in, you know, over a half a million dollars in five months in memberships. Uh, during those five months, our average weekly attendance went up to 4,242, which is 53% higher than the same five months a year back. Um, so if you remember, we reopened in March. And so looking at March 2021 through July compared to March 2022 through July. So 53% increase, I think is pretty good. And you can feel it for those of you that go to the sports center. Um, you can definitely feel uh, new energy and new people, and um, it's really exciting. Swim lessons have been um, just uh, just blockbuster. We can't keep up um, because of staffing issues, but during those five months, we offered over a thousand group lessons and over three thousand private lessons. Um, many, I mean, everyone knows about the staffing shortage, but for whatever reason, I, I don't know, lifeguards are particularly um, impacted. It's a nationwide issue of trying to hire lifeguards. Um, and so we actually, over the summer, June and July, we had 400 children on the wait list for swim lessons. And um, we just couldn't provide them because we didn't have enough staff to do it. So that's something that we're obviously continuing to try to recruit and retain and uh, get more lifeguards and swim instructors so that we can, you know, provide more of that service. Uh, facility rentals are also going well, 36 birthday parties. Um, for those of you that haven't seen it, we have a, an obstacle course called a Wibbit. And that's the picture you see there with the kids sitting on the Wibbit. Um, most birthday parties now, they will rent the Wibbit. It's an additional add-on fee, but almost every birthday party does it because it's so much fun. Um, and then we've had 161 lane reservations and lane reservations could be um, uh, people practicing scuba or you know they're doing a swim test for uh, Boy Scouts, a variety of reasons why people would rent an individual lane, um, but that's also going very well. And then our sports programs, martial arts is going really well, um, 166 participants in that program. That's a four week program that just continues to cycle through. Um, and most of those are repeat customers that stay with us and stay with the program. We're actually having a belt promotion um, in a few days to um, recognize those that have gone up to the next level. Youth basketball clinics have gone very well and co-ed volleyball continues to be popular. Um, we would love to bring back our basketball leagues, um, but again, due to staffing, we're really challenged. We're trying to figure out how to do that um, because uh, we really need a good handful of folks that we can count on to coach and ref. Um, the part-time staff that we've used for years and years and years are no longer with us, and we're having a hard time recruiting them. So we're trying to figure out how to bring the league back. But in the meantime, we're doing a lot of private lessons, a lot of clinics, kind of shorter term commitments um, that Ryan Nunez can, can facilitate. Um, summer sports camp was so good this year. Uh, we did eight one week sessions. We uh, averaged about 90 kids per session. Um, brought in 92,000 in net revenue. That's after we've deducted the expenses, that is just the net revenue. Um, this is the largest sports camp we have had in history. Um, if you look just at sports camp. So in the past, we've also had cheer camp involved or we've had other things um, that made it larger. But if you just look at sports camp specifically, it is the largest 
camp we've ever had. It's um, produced the most revenue of any camp we've ever had. Um, and I have to give a shout out to Ryan Nunes. He is a one person show and he did a great job recruiting uh, part-time staff who also did a fabulous job. And it just was, it, it was shocking how well it went and how smooth it went considering um, our challenges, but really, really exciting. And, you know, we're going to follow right back up with a fall sports camp. So that was good. Um, personal training is booming right now. We've sold almost 1300 sessions for almost $40,000. Group exercise continues to be one of our strongest programs. Um, it seems like every time we add a class, we just get more participants. So the average class size of 20 has kind of been the same since we started, but we just keep adding more and more classes and getting more and more people. So uh, that's a cornerstone program and it's really bringing people in. So we're excited about that. And if you didn't know, we had a 30th anniversary on June 1st, which was really exciting. Um, we didn't have the resources to do a big party or anything, but we wanted to make it fun. So um, it opened, uh, Sports Center opened in 1992. So we did kind of a 90s theme and some folks kind of dressed up in 1990s fitness gear. And we made sure all of our instructors played 1990s music in their classes. Um, we rolled back the daily admission to 1992, so it was um, very, very affordable for folks to come in on that day. Uh, we also did a 30 days for $30 um, promotion, which you can see the line in the lobby. We The lobby looked like that literally all day long. Um, we ended up selling almost 500 memberships, and most of those people are brand new to the Sports Center. They have not been members in the past. Um, and it was a record day for revenue as well. So our goal has been to convert them from one month, 30 days to, we did a summer promotion for three months and we converted almost everybody to that. Mm -hmm. And then September one, we're hoping to convert them into an annual membership. So we're really trying to create some scaffolding, um, for folks. And I have to say on that day, as busy as we were, there was not one complaint about waiting time, about anything. Um, instead, as we were walking through and handing people forms to fill out and clipboards and pens, trying to keep things going, they were saying, thank you so much for doing this. We appreciate this so much. I had several people say to me, I've never been able to afford to bring my family to the sports center, but because you're doing 30 days for $30, I can. Um, it was just the most positive day I think we've had at the sports center in a really long time. Everyone was so appreciative. And then going past that, just seeing all the new people in there, you know, when you work there every day, you start to see the same faces over and over, over again. And that month of June um, was just like kind of a breath of fresh air with brand new people. Um, kind of funny because they were, you know, we didn't have time to give everyone a tour. So they're kind of walking around like, where's the locker room? Uh, where's the pool? But it was a really, really positive day. And my staff just knocked it out of the park as usual. So very happy about that. All right, looking at fiscal year 2022, um, we originally budgeted 1.3 million. At mid-year, we revised our revenue to 1.5 million. We actually brought in 2.3 million. Wow. And so again, kudos to my staff. Um, I just feel like they knocked it out of the park. They exceeded the expectation by a million dollars. And I just couldn't be happier about that. And you think about the front desk that's gone from five or six full-time people to one, and they still have been able to process that kind of revenue. So very excited about that. And then starting off fiscal year 23, very strong. Um, I know it's only five weeks of July, but comparing to July, 2022, um, revenue is up 20% already. So uh, we're feeling really positive, feeling like things are going in the right direction. And um, with the help of the consultants, we are feeling really confident that um, we're gonna be better than ever shortly. And what's up for programs? So we're gonna run another fall break sports camp, which um, we're looking forward to. We'll continue with youth volleyball and basketball clinics and private lessons. We really wanna expand our swim lessons. Um, it is so needed in this area um, considering where we live, obviously, we really want to provide that service to um, families and especially young children. Uh, it's just a matter of hiring up enough people. 
Uh, we want to start a program that we used to call um, pre-team, which was basically a swim development program, getting kids ready to try out for like a high school swim team. Um, we have not launched that yet. We're hoping to launch it soon. We're going to rename it um, Youth Swim Academy, um, hoping to do that. Group exercise, um, we only have the budget to maybe add one or two more classes, but uh, we will be adding those classes and constantly looking at, at the schedule and, and usage and moving things around as needed. And then um, as Shan talked about earlier, we hope to launch the new software in the fall. So a lot going on at the sports center. <laughs> and I'll turn it over to Karen. And finally, back this spring, we don't wanna forget that we, oh, and a congratulations to one of our own Parks and Rec commissioners, Donna Gibson for being recognized as a CPRS District 6 Distinguished Volunteer, along with Anita Roth, who was also recognized as a, a volunteer. She helps us with the Kiwanas and they're just a tremendous support to not only cutting day with the, the Parks Division, but also with all of our meal distribution programs over the holidays uh, with the Recreation Division. So we want to make sure, even though the spring seems like a while ago, we want to make sure we get that shout out to our awesome volunteers. And then we concluded uh, July, we recognized Parks and Recreation Month, and we were recognized at City Council with a proclamation um, celebrating Parks and Recreation Month. So that was very exciting for our team. And that concludes our presentation. Um, I guess I'd like to open it for public comments on this presentation. And do we, do we need to give the instructions? The Nate needs to, yeah. Yes, the, the city of Monterey is committed to the safe attendance of its public meetings. Masks are required for all, recommended, excuse me, for all who attend in person, regardless of vaccination status except for those who are younger than two years of age or have a medical condition that prevents wearing a mask. We ask that attendees also in the council chambers, please mute your phones and devices um, due to possible feedback with the hybrid meeting. If you are not joining us in person in the council chambers, there are two ways to virtually participate in this meeting. You may join the meeting directly on ZoomGov using the Zoom app and you can also call into the Zoom meeting. To join the meeting on Zoom on your computer, smartphone, or telephone, use a link or phone number on the agenda at isearchmonterey.org. Since the meeting has started, you'll find the agenda under the recent tab. To call into the Zoom meeting, dial toll free 833-568-8864. Then enter meeting ID 160-922. 2935 pound. And if prompted to enter a participant ID, press pound again. Detailed instructions on using Zoom are available at monterey.org slash public meeting. To make a public comment using the Zoom app, you can virtually raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button on the bottom of your screen. If you dialed in by phone, raise your hand by dialing star nine. Then to unmute yourself, you must dial star six. You must do both. Public commenters will be muted until it is their turn to speak. I will call on each public speaker in the order of their hands raised. Please stay within the time limit, time limit that we have established for today's meeting, which will be shown using a countdown timer on the screen. If you are connected live on Zoom, the timer is accurate with no delay. Today's meeting is also streamed live on the city's YouTube account, which is accessible at YouTube dot com slash city of Monterey with approximately 10 second delay and on Com Comcast channel 25 with up to 90 second delay. As always, we look forward to receiving your public comments. So first, we'll start with any public comment on the presentation with people in the council chambers. Please approach the lectern. And there's there's no one stepping forward. <laughs> Oh, wait, there is one. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Michael Lang. Uh, I had one question on the Sports Center presentation, um, and I don't know if you can answer, and if you can't, that's fine. 
Um, I was just curious because I saw on this table of N NCIP projects for parks and recs, there was $1.2 million for dehumidifier replacement. And I was just curious because it sounds like you had a great financial performance this last year, going $1 million over in terms of revenue um, and tw up 20% already this year. And so I'm just curious why NCIP funds were used for sports center dehumidifier replacement, especially when that's somewhere in the neighborhood of 25% of the total NCIP budget. Um, and, and if that's the case, I'm just curious, if, is there any plan to repay that funds to NCIP in the future? Thank you. Um, so while we did very well with revenue, we are still um, far below where we need to be and where we were pre-COVID. Um, and so the sports center still is trying to bounce back. Um, we're not where we need to be. Um, and typically a large project like that does not come out of our operating budget. It's something that's um, funded differently, either through NCIP or CIP. It's not part of our regular operating budget. Does that answer your question? No, I don't believe so. Are there any other more public comments in the about the presentation in the, um, in the meeting? Yes. Just a clarification: Will there be a public comment uh, after the yeah. Yes. Uh, is there anyone online? Yes, we do have a public comment online. Jean Rash, you may make your public comment. Thank you. Uh, this is Jean Rash. I'm president of the Monterey Vista Neighborhood Association. I just want to thank um, staff for the rapidity with which um, they went to a final proposal on the sharing of the two tennis courts at Via Paraiso Park, one for pickleball and one, and one for tennis. Um, I think it was very wise to move that along before um, before anyone on, uh, on either side of tennis or pickleball um, had an opportunity to, to rethink um, what a, a desire for um, either more tennis access or more pickleball access when the um, pilot pro project worked so well. I think it was wise to, to not let it go fallow and to um, decide it. So thank, thank you for that, that promptness. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Is there anyone else? Madam Chair, there is no other public comment online for this item. Okay, public comments are now closed. Uh, are there comments from PRC? Go ahead. Sorry, yeah. sit down. <clears throat> I'm stunned at how well you're doing in such a difficult environment yet again. Um, and I know there's going to be a lot to be gained by bringing these outside consultants. I thought maybe if you could give me an idea of the top three benefits that you hope to gain from bringing in the consultants, since you really are doing a pretty stellar job to begin with. You know, one of the top three is space utilization, uh, being that COVID has changed the way that people work out and people who, the way that they consume our services. And we have some spaces within the facility that we need to decide, do we wanna bring back the cafe? Do we wanna bring back babysitting? Those types of things, uh, what's the best way to use that space? What is the most appropriate use of that? And they have, very detailed experience and tools and software that help them with square footage and space utilization and that type of thing. So we're really excited to get that insight from them. Um, they also do a very detailed financial analysis. We're recreators, we're not financial people. So they're doing a deep dive into the finances, which I think is also very helpful. The, um, the third thing I think that's going to be very valuable is looking at staffing levels. Um, mm -hmm. As you all know, we went from 28 full-time staff to six full-time staff. We are managing, but um, we don't feel it's sustainable. 
And so we're really looking forward to their recommendations on what um, new full-time positions, if any, that they're going to recommend. And if not, then how do we create efficiencies um, to streamline some of our operational processes? Um, because, you know, the old processes with the new staffing model are very challenging. So something is going to have to give either on the staffing side or on the operational side, service levels, et cetera. Um, so that's another area that I think will be very, very valuable. So is this report for for recreation for the sports center? Uh, and you get to decide the path forward? The city will decide the path forward for sure. Okay. And you mentioned the survey going out to the public? Yes, it'll go out to both sports center users as well as the community at large. We won't be limiting it to just current okay. users. I think that will be valuable too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ellen, do you have a question? Yeah. I know Dennis said something. Okay. You know, I'm wondering if having these consultants would help bolster um the um, plans for moving forward with the sports center, it adds a certain gravitas or um, a certain financial strength underpinning that would um, benefit things moving forward. And so for that reason, I was um, thinking that, that there was some good to be had from this because my first reaction was, we know what the sports center needs, <laughs> but you know, to put it in concrete financial terms and to compare it to facilities around the country or similar um, communities probably is helpful in um, underlying the 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 real need that we have. Does that sound right? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up that. Um... They are um, very strong in analytics and they have access to a lot more data than we would ever have access to. And so um, I think that's, you know, as as you're speaking, they're going to be able to bring that perspective. Um, you know, I also feel like for the most part, we pretty much know what to do at the sports center. <laughs> um, you know, we've had people there a very, very long time, longer than I've been there. Um, but it's seeing the data really from across the nation. Um, of similar uh, operations that I think is really going to be helpful. Yeah. Just so long as I guess there's consideration that we are coming out of a pandemic. Yes. So the last two years have not been normal. Right. And I think they understand that, which is really great. And we're appreciative that they are also recreators. So they appreciate the recreation piece of our facility that we're not just a private health club, basically, that they understand that we have a recreation piece. So I think that that's really good as well. And it also, it's been validating for us as a team too, because there's some things that we have mentioned. They're like, yes, absolutely right. You guys are, you're spot on. You should be thinking about those things. So it's been helpful for us as a team to get that feedback from them as well. I know Dennis had comments. I just have three things, three areas, just real quick, and I'll lump one of them together if I heard correctly. And maybe this also is going to be some of the feedback you get. From are you so turned on? I'll, I'll, I had three areas that I wanted to ask about, and I'll lump them together. And, um, and, and as I said, maybe you'll get this feedback from the consultants. But as, as I heard it, field sports, Camp Kiansabe, and swimming, if you had more staff, you could make more money. Yes, absolutely. That's a simple statement, but that's, that's true. That's accurate. For swim lessons, it's absolutely accurate. Probably okay. double. Okay. All right. That's what I thought. Generally, it helps with camps, too, uh, because we get... When you have higher volume, it kind of helps you on your return on investment as well. Okay. That's that was my impression. But okay, second second is just related to swimming, and, and I should know this, but I don't. Do you ever offer lifeguard training classes? Yes, yes. we do both um, in house and for the public. Um, and we actually just offered one. I think it was two weekends ago. And generally, we've historically we've grown our own lifeguards. A lot of them start out as program participants, maybe as young as three or four years old, or even little babies, and grow up with us, and then take the class and then become work. But we had two years off, you know, where people weren't taking swimming lessons. You know, we have swim instructors now that are teaching at a level that normally we have a lot of three to five year olds in those beginning levels, 
And then by the time they get to five and seven, they're more at the mid to higher levels. But now it's like a lot of our beginners are five to seven years old. So um, we generally grow our own lifeguards and swim instructors. So, so how can I find out about the lifeguard training? Because if it's something I want to do and, and I can take one or two classes, that helps. So, but I don't, I didn't know that they were available. So yeah, they publicize it. <laughs> yeah, when when uh, we are offering it, we publicize it on our website and through social media, um, and then uh, internally as well. Some of the monitors and whatnot. I I do have to say that we have not done like print ads and you know the weekly or anything Got for it. that type of class. But okay. do we need to add you to the list, Dennis? Add me to the list. Okay. I don't want. I don't want. I don't do social media. So you'll need to subscribe to our newsletter. <laughs> anyway. Um, and, and just at the last one, I think real quick, and that is, you mentioned solicito and improvements. W what is that? Because that place is buffed out with, you know, <laughs> grass that's gone and, and everything else in the world. What, what, what's the thought on that? So there are areas of the artificial turf that are worn. Um, we've had to replace the batter's box usually every year. Um, this past year, we did it in the spring. It actually does need um, some repairs already. Um, First, second, and third base are worn, so those need to be done. And then there's some discussion about replacing the clay pitcher's mound with um, some sort of artificial turf or new, um, something different because the clay um, kind of gets off um, onto the artificial turf, which is like carpet, it clogs the carpet, affects the drainage, and then that shortens the life okay. of the field. Um, so, we're looking to make some repairs that would extend the lifetime of the field without having to fully repair or replace the entire field. Okay, that, that helps. I misunderstood because I thought it was some, you know, capital project that was going to go on at the field as opposed to making it, you know, continuing mm -hmm. to repair it so that it's useful. So thank you. Yeah, it's a, a continuing investment into a, a, a large investment that was made by the community yeah. to keep that up, up, up to speed. Okay. Thank you. I just have one one question. I guess it has to do with Shannon. Something you mentioned about fundraising for campership opportunities. Do you guys have a plan for that? I mean, I, the library was incredibly successful with their their nonprofit. Uh, yeah. the The nonprofit does take a lot of staff effort and time, which we just don't have the capacity to invest in the friends of the recreation. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say that. The Camp Kinsabi campership account is very healthy because there has been so many families, so many multi generations who contribute regularly. So, not really so concerned about Camp Kinsabi camperships or funding for that at this time. Um, but funding for day camp camperships and the playground program definitely could use some assistance. Um, and we have been reaching out to like community organizations and okay. filling out applications and things like that. But um, right now, with our workload, we couldn't take on like a a, a full fundraising um, campaign for okay. campers. Just wondered. Okay, any other comments? If not, let's move on to the next agenda item, which is approval of the minutes from uh, April thirteenth meeting. Are there any questions or comments? If not, would a commissioner care to make a motion? I move to approve. Is there a second? Sure. Sid? Is there any other further discussion? If not, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, okay, Kristen said aye too. <laughs> I said aye. Hey, it's passed. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we've now come to public comments. And these are comments addressed on <clears throat> anything that was not on our agenda. Um, and Nate, I will call and you process the callers online. And if there's anyone in the audience that would like to care to speak, uh, please step forward to the podium. Yes, to make a public comment, um, please, um, if you're using the Zoom app and you virtually raise your hand by pressing the raise your hand button on the bottom of your screen, if you dialed in by phone, raise your hand by dialing star nine and then to unmute yourself. Um, to speak, it's star six. You must do both. But if there's anyone in the council chamber that would like to make a general public comment, please approach the lector. Sure. 
There's no one in the council chambers with public comment. Let me look online. There's no one online that would like to make a general public comment. Okay, so public comments are now closed. I'd now like to turn to the uh, report on the commission appointment process. And Shannon, I think you're going to present this. Sure. So we would, the recommendation is to appoint a chair and a vice chair for the Parks and Recreation Commission to serve a term for fiscal year 2022-2023. Um, the uh, boards and commissions were switched over from calendar year to fiscal year prior to COVID-19. At that time, uh, Donna Gibson and Ellen McEwen served a six month term from January to June um, as chair and vice chair. And then we reappointed them for a full uh, year um, to serve as chair and vice chair because in order to get us back on this new uh, cycle. Um, and then also during this time, COVID happened um, and we kind of shut down and I can't even begin to speculate how many, how, what a kind of a gap there was between commission meetings. And then since then the meetings have been an, it kind of infrequent. So both uh, Donna and Ellen served as chair and vice chair in an acting capacity or official capacity uh, for, ooh, I would say two and a half years. <laughs> so we wanna, <laughs> it's been a while. It's been a while. Not, maybe not, I wonder how many meetings we had total in that time, <laughs> but it was a long time. And so we'd like to thank you both for doing that. Um, and now that we are, you know, kind of in more of a regular cycle and we're getting back into more normal operations, we'd like to move forward with moving Ellen from her two and a half year vice chair <laughs> position uh, to a full chair. Um, and then we would like Christian Schmidt to serve as our vice chair for a year. Um, and then that means Christian would be our chair um, the next go around. Um, and I, then we'll have to see who the vice chair would be after that, depending on, um, uh, time served and who's next in the rotation. Um, but so that is the recommendation is that we, um, if there's any discussion or anything, we can, we can talk about that as well, but make, uh, essentially make a motion to, uh, make this transition official. Um, we've checked with both Ellen and Christian, and they are willing to serve as chair and vice chair. Um, and so we want to also thank Donna for her commitment to the position as chair um, and her time spent with us. <laughs> but um, yeah, we were. Yeah, my only comment is that I know it will be in very good hands with Ellen and Christian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hard shoes to fill. No, no, I don't think so. But... <laughs> But uh, I'm glad, I will be glad to have them. Are there any other questions of staff, uh, commissioners on this? And are there any public comments on this change? Anyone in the council chambers would like to make a public comment on this item, please approach the lector. If there's no public comment in the council chambers, again, if you're logged on, press the raise hand button on the bottom of your screen if you're logged, logged on by Zoom. If you dialed in by phone, press star nine to make a public comment on this item. There is no public comment on Zoom on this item, Madam Chair. Okay, so public comments are now closed. I'd like to return to the commission and we need to vote on this. Uh, would someone care to make a motion? Yes, I'll go ahead and do it. Uh, I move that we uh, adopt staff recommendations and that Ellen become the chair and Christian become the vice chair as, uh, as it's laid out. And I second it. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> okay. We have a new chair starting next week, oh, next, next month, excuse that's me. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Uh -oh. <laughs> okay, now we're turning to reviewing the NCIP program, the projects for fiscal year 2022-2023.
Um, and Karen, uh, we're looking at conformity, I guess, to park, Parks and Rec master plan. Yes, and we've invited Tom Hardy, who is our NCIP coordinator and our acting city engineer right now um, to make the presentation for you. Thank you, we all set. Thank you, Nate. We can go to the next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to, I always start with just an overview of what the, the NCIP committee is doing this year. And um, here it is up on the screen. It's just briefly, we began um, uh, reviewing the projects in March. Our, our proposals were stopped. We took all the requests that came in and we began reviewing and screening the projects uh, between March and June. Um, there were, I know some of you actually attended several of the meetings and um, we're trying to streamline things. I think we did pretty well this year, but there's always improvements that we can make. So um, we're going ahead with that. But um, on June 16th, we brought all the projects that had been proposed that were not um, withdrawn or eliminated and voted on them that evening. So each neighborhood, there are 15 neighborhoods that are in town and each neighborhood votes on each project. Um, they have a vote of between zero points to 10 points for every project and we add up all the votes. And then at the end of the evening, we can rank the projects. Um, the, the ones receiving the highest number of votes are at the top of the list and the ones with the lowest number of votes are at the bottom of the list. And if you could go to the next slide, Nate, please. So what we did, this is actually um, our, our priority list. Um, and we began at the top, the first one there, you can't really read it on this screen, but it's the accessible beach mats project received the highest number of any of the other projects this year. And we just take um, just based on the number of votes that they received and just rank them from one to 154. And so once that was done at, in the middle of June, we began to do more detailed cost estimates on each project. Um, and we had actually, we finished that yesterday. So the, the information that's included in the agenda packet is a little bit outdated, but it doesn't affect the results, yes. Yeah, that Shannon passed out earlier this evening. So if we could go to the next slide, Nate, also. So here are the project. This is from the last, um, this is not the updated one we received tonight, but this is in the agenda packet. And I just wanted to um, just go through, this is the first page. All of the projects on the first page um, are expected to be funded. So I should take another step backward. Next week on Thursday evening, the NCIP committee will meet again. We have received, we found out also um, this week from finance, the amount of funding that we'll receive this year. Uh, we will be bringing that to the NCIP committee. Um, they will, the first thing they'll do is they'll vote to set aside a contingency amount on the, the total project budget. This year, as many of us know, um, just finding materials and contractors and things has been really difficult. The prices have skyrocketed for everything. Um, our construction costs have increased by 10% since December of this year, which is really unusual. It's usually about 4% per year. So we're, um, I'm expecting that the committee will wanna um, set aside a, a larger contingency than normal. Um, so we'll find out next week on Thursday and it will know exactly um, which, what the committee wants to do and then which projects we can actually fund. But all of the ones on the first page um, from the agenda packet will be able to be funded. And if we go to the next slide, um, we get down through, I'm gonna look at this one or I can read it. The, uh, the Larkin Park Swing Project um, is also able to be funded this year. And then depending on the amount of contingency that's set aside, 
uh, will depend on whether the next one, uh, which is the Via Paraiso Park Tennis Court <coughs> Restriping Project. Um, that we'll have to see, we'll find out next week on Thursday whether that project will be funded. Uh, the three at the bottom, the Deer Flats, the Tree Inventory and the Casanova Oak Knoll Park Improvements uh, will not be funded this year. There's not enough funding uh, that we received to fund those. And then it's actually not terribly likely that the Via Paraiso Tennis um, Court restriping project will be funded either. And I can get into that a little bit later. And if you would like, I can go through each of the projects. You've seen these before. Um, I prepared a slide of each one <clears throat> just to show um, where they rank um, in order from one to 154. Um, and if we go to the next slide, we can start doing that. Or if you don't even want to go through that, um, that's okay too. But I'll try and do this quickly. Um, the first project at the top of the list received the most number of votes of anything uh, is the Accessible Beach Mat Project. And then next slide. The uh, second project is the Del Monte Beach Walkway Repair Project. That was funded as well. And then, yep, the number three was the Capital Fuel Reduction and Cleanup Project. It was the third highest ranking project. And number four was the Green Belt Fuel Reduction Project. The, uh, the project that scored eight was the Sports Center Pool Modernization Project. That's how we came in and um, through the process, we split that into, I think it was, well, six or eight or 10 different smaller projects. This was the number one on the priority. And this was actually funded as well. Then um, this one didn't show up on the list, but it's it's in Laguna Grande Park, so it's a parking lot lighting project. It's not really it's a it's going to be Public Works, um, who will hire a contractor to go out and install um, pedestrian scale lighting out there. But it's not really a parks concern. But because it's in a park, I thought I just mention it tonight. Then the uh, Casanova Oak Knoll Park, the play structure, this is that curve of spinner that the neighborhood children um, decided that they, they really wanted to see out there a number of years ago. The uh, Via Prize of Park Expression Swings will be funded. And then we have the same expression swings at Dennis the Menace Park. Um, also receiving funding. And the capital site, the master plan, uh, we had money, well, we the NTIP committee will be allocating money toward this project that made the funding cut uh, this year. So we'll be able to look at how we can utilize the park moving into the future. And then the community-wide restroom study, there was, as I was um, working with Shannon on the agenda report, I realized that in the past, this project had been submitted as a project to do a, a citywide study, but then also a proposed building a restroom, at, I think it was Elastero Park. So that is not part of this proposal. This is just to do the study this year, which is what's submitted. So there's no construction with this. It's just a, a research and report on that. And then um, project that well, it's ranked number 25 is the Larkin Park Swings Installation Project up at Larkin Park. And then this is the one. So now we start, we've run out of um, guaranteed funding depending again on the amount that the NTIP committee chooses to establish as a contingency for the program. Um, this, it's possible that this could be um, funded, but this year, just as we were talking a few minutes ago, because of the way that construction is and obtaining materials and um, 
the way the costs are rising every month, um, it's unlikely that, well, we'll find out, but I'm, I would be pretty surprised if the, the committee chose to go with a 10% contingency this year, just because it's a little low. Um, a lot of these projects will take, well, the larger projects will take more than a year so we might have a you know 20 percent increase in cost over that period of time too so it's we'll see what happens it's possible that this could be funded um, as a cutoff project which means that the amount of funding that we receive this year um, is already allocated for but if projects come in under budget we'll take the the remaining budget and put it into an account. And as that account builds, as projects are completed, we can continue to work our way down the list of priorities and complete projects on there. And this would be the second cutoff project um, if, depending on what happens next at the NCIP committee. So this one is squarely iffy, if that's a word. Thanks, Nate. And then um, the Deer Flart, the Deer Flats Park bench renovation project was did not get funded this year. The uh, community wide tree inventory was also not funded. And the Casanova Oak Knoll Park, um, they had requested improvements to install a couple of umbrellas and to uh, remove the chain link fence and install a fence that matched some other fence that's been installed around the park and that one was not funded as well. And then this is a little bit further down the list. Um, this was ranked project number 52. So it was about a third of the way down the entire list, but on um, the pickleball court complex, uh, we located back in well, 20, well, it was before COVID hit, but we identified that um, adjacent to the, the stinging jellies, the um, disc golf course, there's an area where a pickleball court could be placed, constructed over there. So that was the proposal was to um, design and construct a court out at Ryan Ranch. Um, but that again, didn't make the cut this year. And that was just, that was not close this year, but um, Shannon asked just that we mention that this evening. So those are the projects that um, parks that we had looked at back in April. And I'd be happy to answer any questions about either the program or any specific project that we discussed or um, any other one too, that's on the, the list this year. The commissioners, do you guys have any questions? I, I did. Yes. Yes. Uh, the question question was the projects that didn't get funded or didn't get picked. Uh, remind me again, what happens to those? Are they just thrown out or do they get rolled around into the next year's budget? Um, we are at this point, we haven't addressed that specifically as a committee, but at this point, um, or uh, my expectation is that if um, the person would like to nominate it again, they can uh, nominate it for next year. And you can nominate a project any time of the year, but um, at the beginning of the year, probably sometime between end of January, beginning of March again, we'll have a cutoff date. And then any projects that we have received by then will be considered for the next cycle next year. So, they will, the, the best thing to do is resubmit if, if your project did not get funded this year, it would be to resubmit uh, another nomination form for next year. Great, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I haven't been part of the process before, so this is, this is all new to me. Uh, now that it goes to the city council, um, how thorough of a vetting does city council do? Or are they pretty much rely on the process that's already happened? The um, This is my first time through the process as well. But my understanding is that the 
The NTIP committee, it's a um, an advisory committee. So the council, I believe, trusts what the NTIP recommendation is. Um, there may be specific projects that they question, um, but for the most part, um, my understanding is that they'll they'll accept what the the committee comes up with. Did that answer the question? Okay. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, I have I had a comment. This actually is not your control, but just a comment and that is you know, that uh, Leo Price of turn your mic on. I'll just leave it on so I don't talk anyway. Mm -hmm. All right. The the Via Paraiso Park tennis court restriping. Again, uh, this is just a message to the NCIP, and they, they're well aware of this. This has been round and round and round in this community for pick a number of years. And if it can get accomplished, it really should get accomplished. Um, and that's a statement as opposed to a question, because it, again, it's not shooting at you. That's not fair. Um, but I'd hate to see all of that mediation work go to waste and not get funded through this process or or if it's not going to get funded and that's the decision we need to start thinking about how it can get funded um, because it needs to happen sooner rather than later so that's just my observation yes thank you with my microphone on <laughs> i concur with that this best opinion myself yeah. any other comments if you would um, like to make a public comment on this item and you're in the council chambers, please approach the lectern. And this is on the NCIP uh, presentation. There's no public comment from anyone. Uh, there yeah. are. Yeah. So I'm Jay Swaggerman and I'm the um pickleball uh advisor here and i was one of the uh people on the uh mediation and <clears throat> after two or three meetings and stuff we came up with this proposal now everybody is supporting it and if it doesn't get funded I'm not sure where we go so we're kind of out no road Thanks. Hi, John Sovereign. I was also on the um, participated in the mediation team, and I just wanted to echo everything that the commissioners and Jay um, have said. If news to me that this is on the cusp. I guess we need to, uh, you know, figure out what to do uh, over the next week or so. Um, I sent a letter in um, via email. Uh, the main thing I wanted to point out was that, you know, two and a half years ago, this particular project was just one piece of what the mediation team came up with as a proposal. Um, that's uh, a key thing just in terms of communication, but uh, now we got to go figure out where the money is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, again, Michael Lang. Um, I am the current president of Monterey Bay Pickleball uh, Club. And, um, so I wasn't part of the mediation process. We specifically decided to try and keep the club out of the mediation process because we were a bit of a, a target in the past. And so we figured we would select three members from the uh, neighborhood community that this directly affected to participate in the mediation. Um, so after the mediation was over, we, we talked to the people that did participate in the mediation about you know, you know what were the pros and the cons and so forth. And it was specifically mentioned that the improvements that we would be getting um, were the reasons for accepting the mediation. Um, because obviously we know, if you go back a few years, right, we were looking at putting in six courts, right? We were trying to go from four courts to six courts. 
Um, and that's when the whole issue with the neighborhood and the, the, the noise really kind of blew up. Um, so now we're going the wrong way, right? We're going from four courts to two courts. Meanwhile, over the last two years, pickleball across the United States has grown almost 40%. And we're seeing that type of growth in, the community, in, in our community as well. Um, it's not become a huge problem because Carmel, for example, has added two new courts. Uh, so that's helped take the load off of Via Paraiso. Um, likewise, we're now seeing people that used to play in, in Via Paraiso going over and playing in Seaside. So, um, you know, I think it's really quite unfortunate. I mean, frankly, it sounds a little bit like a bait and switch uh, where we thought we had an agreement and now the agreement's going away. Um, so that, that's one comment I wanted to make. The other comment I wanted to make was really, I want to try and look forward, <laughs> right? Where do we go from here? Because pickleball, like I said, is growing substantially. And so my comments now are more toward Ryan Ranch, right? The, the, the item that was quite a ways down the list on NCIP. Um, I, I really would like to try and find a way to get this done. Um, when we look across the peninsula, we have four places we can play pickleball from a public standpoint. There's courts in Pacific Grove, uh, Via Paraiso, Carmel, and Seaside. Um, all of them are small facilities embedded within neighborhoods. And we have complaints from neighbors from all four sites. Uh, we have a neighbor at Carmel that is very unhappy. We have neighbors that are, are unhappy in Seaside. And Pacific Grove actually pretty much settled their situation with the neighbors a, a couple of years ago. So I'd really like to see if we can find a way to build something away from houses, away from people, you know, neighbors where we're going to be a disturbance, um, whether that's Ryan Ranch or somewhere else. Um, but we're kind of limited right on the peninsula. We're pretty, pretty landlocked. There's not a lot of options. Um, I know I'm speaking to the choir because I know you guys have always really supported us in the past, um, but I just wanted to kind of give you some of those comments and, and hopefully maybe next year we can do something. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? And there's no one online. We have public comment online. We will start with Rick Hoyer. Please go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, greetings, Commission. My name is Rick Hoyer. I am the chairman of the uh, NCIP. Uh, I just want to uh, clarify or further amplify a couple of the questions that you all had asked. As far as projects that didn't make the cut, we're figuring out exactly how that's going to work this year. Because this year was exceedingly challenging in that there were about 100 projects that had previously been funded, been approved, and had money allocated against them. But then during COVID, City Council decided to deappropriate those funds. So uh, while there's a lot of great new projects, there were also about 100 projects that we had previously funded that we also had to deal with. Those were automatically put back in. We're not certain how long they will continue to be automatically put back in and we'll be citing that at a future meeting. As far as city council and the, the list that we provide to them, the way it is in the city charter, NCIP sets a priority list, sends it to the council that to be funded, they can choose to fund or not fund a project. They don't get to add projects to the list or change the order. Uh, they have in the past decided on certain projects that didn't meet for whatever reason city goals and did pull them off. Uh, whether or not the, the tennis court striping will happen is really a function of how much uh, contingency we need to determine to have. Our concern is, is we do, we approve a list. We want to make sure it all can get built. Uh, and costs are very much a moving target. And we have always in the past uh, allocated some level of contingency and we'll be having active discussions on what that level should be this coming timeframe. Uh, you know, pickleball was there with all the other aspects. It came in ahead of a whole lot of aspect, other projects as well, but not high enough up in order to get funded. And the way it works, it works down the point totals until the money's gone. Uh, and then the next year, those can be back in and be looked at again. Uh, we have often had projects that have been submitted for three, maybe four years before they get funded. Uh, it really comes into what all is in the mix that we have to determine and, you know, and prioritize. 
anyone has any questions they'd like to ask me specifically, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Are there we any do, other? We do have more public comment. Jean Rash, please unmute and go ahead and give us your public comment. Thank you. This is Jean Rash, resident of Monterey, president of the Monterey Vista Neighborhood Association, one of the negotiators at the pickleball and tennis mediation for Via Paraiso Park and vice chair of NCIP this last year. Um, I, I, I appreciate um, Mr. Hoyer reviewing the NCIP um, ground, ground rules and how it functions. And that was all very accurate. I think the confusion and the concern is that the answer achieved in the negotiations was never proposed to be funded by NCIP. It, that, that was a separate project submitted for resurfacing. It was never the answer to the negotiations. And I join with Mr. Sovereign and Mr. Lang and Mr. Swaggerman in the impression that there might be the city coming up with other funds to make this solution of the problems at Via Paraiso Park happen. It, it, it was never contingent upon NCIP. There was never a, a real clear promise of other money, but there certainly was the suggestion that where there might be a will and if we could be good negotiators and we could as a community come up with an answer that the city could help us along. And I, I would hope that the Parks and Recs Committee would chime in to Mr. Usler and if Ms. Larson could do the same, that maybe there is some community improvement project money and you know some funding that is not NCIP that would help this be resolved because I, I agree that there was certainly the impression that we would have citywide support if, if we pulled our weight. So thank you. Thank you. There is no more public comment on this item. Okay, public comments are now closed. I'd like to return to the commission for any more questions, discussion and final comments. We are required to vote on this list. If there aren't any comments, would anyone care to make a motion? And we're basically voting on whether these projects, we consider them to conform to the master plan. Would anyone like to make a sit? Would you like? Okay, is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? That passes. Okay, thank you so much for your presentation. It really helps. And thanks for the comments. I think you know we're all supportive of trying to get these projects done. We just wish there was more money. Uh, Karen, like, well, and now it's staff comments. Thank you. I know it's been a long meeting, but I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, just wanted to comment quickly on the pickleball and tennis situation at Via Paraiso. The, the pilot program went really well. It seemed that it worked for all the parties involved and we didn't have a brand new court at that time. I'm hoping that the behaviors of everyone who participated in the pickleball program or the pilot program will continue to do so. So hopefully there should be no change in operations of how we handle the, the park and the playing of those two different sports. It was, we were disappointed about the NCIP and poor Tom heard it from me already earlier today. So we are, we're disappointed as well. And hopefully it will make it as a, 
a cutoff program, a cutoff program project. I actually do hope that, but uh, we'll continue to advocate for resolving the situation at Via Paraiso. The other thing I wanted to mention is I wanted to thank the staff for all the work they've been doing for the last few months. They've been doing a lot of heavy lifting and got us through a summer and reinstating new programs that had been uh, in hiatus for a couple of years. And that's a heavy lift, um, especially being short staffed and being down uh, even our full-time people. So I appreciate the whole team. Thank you for, very much. I also wanted to thank the commissioners. I know we don't have a lot of meetings on a very consistent basis, but I feel your support and our team feels your support in between meetings. Uh, you're constantly in touch with us. You feel comfortable coming to us. We feel comfortable calling you. Uh, you're also always supporting us, whether it's going to NCIP meetings and advocating for parks and recreation projects or traveling to Camp Kinsabi to see camp in action or participating in our sports center operational analysis. Um, all of you have just been incredibly supportive and we really can't thank you enough. So thank you. Um, I just really want to recognize uh, the sports center staff. Um, obviously, you can see how much um, production we are getting out of a small uh, group. They just are a stellar, stellar team. Um, and also the part-time staff. I mean, we are so heavily reliant on our part-time staff now, and we have several that have just really, really stepped up, and we consider them paraprofessionals. Um, and that's been great. And then also just an appreciation for members and guests being patient with us, um, understanding that uh, this is kind of new territory for us trying to figure out how to operate with such limited resources. And for the most part, you know, members and guests have been um, very supportive and complimentary, even though, you know, we know the locker room floors need to be redone. We know it's not as clean as it used to be. We know we don't have certain services, but um, like I said, for the most part, the members and guests have been very supportive. And so I just um, wanted to thank everyone for that. So um, I, I would also like to thank Louie and our parks division, parks operations. We could not have pulled off our summer programs in our parks without Louie's staff and support and actually um, public works as well, custodial and building maintenance chipped in. Um, to make sure, because we program in our parks um, and even in the county parks at Toro. So, you know, Chris Mexelsberger helped tow all of our heavy equipment out there, our walk-in fridge, our craft trailer, set up our swimming pool. Um, we had some issues with that pool. He was there much longer and from, you know, well into the summer helping us with that issue. Um, we just could not have done Camp Kinsabi without parks and um, they inspected trees and, you know, got day camp ready for us. So it was, it was, it, it parks does so much for us. Um, so I want to thank Louie and his staff, especially Chris um, Mexelsberger. He was amazing. He can't ever retire. <laughs> um, and then I just want to thank my staff, the recreation staff, the recreation team. Um, every single person on the team did something um, in addition to their regular job this summer. Rachel was a key part of day camp because that's her expertise. Nate was at Camp Kinsabi and day camp and kind of handled a lot of administration, um, collecting reg forms and things from all of our parents and tracking people down. Uh, you know, Brent had a full plate of both programs. Um, and adult programs and field users with the Pecos League. Uh, and Sarah has been a huge, huge help um, for quite some time. Um, so she's, um, you know, running the Schulte Park Center, but she's also helping administratively, um, you know, processing permits, daily deposits, handling all kinds of things. So she has that area of expertise. Um, and so she's, you know, she's here helping Melissa with our first Park and Rec Commission meeting with Melissa on board. And then Melissa for just being so patient with us because she did come in at the middle of summer. Um, so it, it's, you know, not the best time to start someone just to drop them in the middle of summer, our busiest time of the year. 
And then Misty, you know, single-handedly handled play, the playground program at three separate locations um, and all of those things. So um, I hope I'm not forgetting anyone, but we're a small team, we're mighty, but everyone had to pick pitch in um, and do something that they not would not normally have done. So, um, and then we had some really key part-time employees. We had Spencer Kleinfelter, Sophie Hanashian, uh, Christina Cook at Camp Gensabi, uh, Nicole Spillett, uh, Noelle Norian, um, and Andrea Diaz Aquino, who were part-time staff that were laid off due to COVID, actually came back and worked for us this summer. And to have that expertise with someone who knows our programs and knows the answers to tell people is invaluable. We just can't get that when you bring on a new part-time employee. So uh, it could not have been done without some really key staff, um, both full-time and part-time. So yeah, we made it. We're still not ready to take a deep <laughs> breath yet, but we're, we're um, yeah, we're hopeful for next summer. So thank you all. And I thank you, Ellen, because I did reach out to you about Camp Kinsabi. I was like, can you help me as our, you know? So thank you very much. So Louie, I know that you're still on. Would you like to make some comments? Sure. I, first of all, thank you, Shannon, for shouting out. I'll, I'll pass it on to the and Chris. Um, uh, take a look uh, when you get around the parks. So go take a look at our landscapes that we've done in Jacks and uh, Deer Flats, uh, the visitor center, Chamber of Commerce. Um, I think our crew does a nice job on that. And also, it's probably good for me to mention that when you go around and you see our lawns are a little bit brown, our turf is a little bit brown. It's not that we don't know what we're doing. It's just that we're trying to save water and you can't keep these lawns green at two days a week. And we're following the rules like everybody else. So if you go to San Carlos Beach and you see it's a little, little brown and we know what we're doing, but we're trying to save some money or trying to save some water and we're following the rules. So I just hope everybody is a little bit patient in the city and we, they're all used to having nice green lawns, but I think those days may be gone for a while until we get some rain. So um, just kind of be patient with us. And uh, that's all I have to say. Okay. It's uh, time for commissioner comments. Anyone like to start? I uh, am the second newest person on the board <laughs> as of today. But I would like to say how much I've enjoyed having you, Donna, as our chair and Ellen as our vice chair. And uh, I look forward to Ellen, you being the chair and uh, Kristen being the vice. And um, I, I just you know, want to thank you. I, I'm sorry that I only had a year under the uh, under the commission uh, to have you as our chair, but yeah. I've appreciated what you've done. Well, not, I haven't gone yet. No, no, not yet. <laughs> not yet. What time is it? <laughs> Donna, it's really, you've gone be above and beyond. Um, so bravo. And um, I may have to call you up and- <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think so, I think you'll be fine. <laughs> anyway, and then to our wonderful Parks and Rec Department, um, you know, you guys are just like superheroes. And, um, and I think you inspire that in other people. So um, you've made it pretty much through the worst and um now now we can go forth and just expand on this wonderful foundation that you've created so thank you very much i guess yeah you know, i'm hoping you pass that on to your staff too how much we know how hard they are working i mean it's if you look at the analytics of how much money you're raising per staff it's pretty amazing you know, with such a short number, a small number of people. I, I really don't know how you do it. But, and I love Camp Kinsabi. I wish I could go now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've never slept under the stars like that, except backpacking. It just looks like a wonderful opportunity for kids. And I just hope you can continue it. So I'm interested in fundraising. So just so you know. Dustin, your first meeting. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just excited to, you know, this undertaking and want to just after talking with Shannon over the last couple of weeks, just how impressed I am with how you guys got everything done with decreasing staff, just 
when I worked here, it was a very different park where there was like six playgrounds and it was a lot bigger and just amazed that you can, you know, still provide these these programs for the kids because it's very important. It's just really impressive. Thank you guys. So just a couple of comments real quick. And first, in terms of Donna, thank you again for this year. And I go jogging on Tuesday morning, and that's when the volunteers in the park are always right. out there, you know, working and, and Donna's leading the group. So that's, I see her doing that as well. So that's the first comment. Second comment is just soldier on and keep up, you know, what you're doing because you're doing a great job. And hopefully, you know, in conjunction with the consultants and as we move forward and things get better because they are improving, things are going to get real better. Uh, that's my my hope and, and belief. So, you know, just hang in there. We don't want to lose anybody when we're on the cusp of, of sort of a breakthrough. And I hope that's where we are. So thank you for your hard work. So Kristen, I, want, I don't want to forget you. I know you're there. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, I wanted to, again, uh, welcome Justin, Melissa into the fold. Um, as much as uh, this is uh, something we're doing for the community. Uh, we're, we're working with each other. And I think you're, you're in good hands. Um, I also wanted to point out to all those pickleball people out there that we are listening. We do, we do care. We're moving forward. Um, a little discouraging with the funding, but um, you know, I got into this for, for the community and when we hear the community still, you won't be forgotten. Um, and uh, Louie, yeah, great job. I had no idea, 140 hours and transient camp removal, it's, uh, that's no small feat. So uh, appreciate everything you're doing. So that's about it. Well, the next meeting with Ellen as chair yeah. and, and Christian as vice chair will be Wednesday, September 14th at 5.30. And I declare this meeting adjourned, my last official act. <laughs>